Today, during this tutorial, we'll be learning how to build an app to find similar images using deep learning. Um, but before we get started, uh, we want to make sure that everybody is installed with GraphLab Create. So how, can I get a show of hands how many folks have managed to install? OK. Um, and how many folks have managed to get the, the data necessary, either from this landing page right here or from the USB sticks in the back. OK, so lots of folks don't have the data yet. Um, so you can either follow this link and go down, scroll down uh, to download the tutorial content and click on this link here. Oh, hold on. It's not uh, showing. One moment. I had a different screen than you guys. OK, so if you follow that link and you, there we go, and you scroll down to download the tutorial content, and you click on that link, you can download it. It's quite a lot, so if the Wi-Fi is being slow, you can also ask for a USB stick. Uh, there, we have some TAs around the room, uh, and especially in the back there. So. Grab a USB stick, download the, uh, the data, and unzip it. Uh, one important note is just to make sure your installation is working, uh, go ahead and open up IPython and import GraphLab, construct an S frame, and uh, just execute this last line of code as well. And if you have any problems, uh, go ahead and grab our TAs, raise your hand and they'll come to you. So any questions? Uh, just, a USB stick. just a USB stick? OK, great. So let's get started uh, with the presentation, with the talk part. All right. One moment. Uh, view, exit full screen. OK, so as Al Alice mentioned, uh, I'm an employee at Dado. Dado is a company of about 40 people, I guess, at this point. And we're located in Fremont. And we're de uh, developing a platform to help implement, manage, and optimize the production ML pipeline. Uh, it looks like this. This uh, slide got a little distorted on the screen there. But uh, the pipeline basically consists of data ingestion, engineering, um, some machine learning, so generating models on that data, and then deploying those models so that they can be consumed by folks in the outside world. So today, we'll be focusing on the deep learning portion of that pipeline. We'll be applying deep learning to that pipeline. And so deep learning has been basically everywhere in the news recently. Um, also, it's been used by many major companies in production already. So Facebook is using it for face detection. Um, I believe many of the big companies, Google, Baidu, and Facebook, are using it in general for just object classification. It's also been uh, made major research news. Uh, for instance, a little while ago, Google DeepMind built a system which plays video games using deep learning. And so, but all of these have one thing in common, and that is that uh, they're very complex systems and they're difficult to understand and um, not very approachable by just general people. So the goal of the talk today is to hit the easy button on deep learning. Um, and we'll be doing that basically by first just going over uh, deep learning fundamentals and uh, getting a fundamental understanding of what's going on so you get a little bit of an intuition. And then we're going to uh, open up our IPython notebooks and get our hands dirty. First, we'll train 
a fairly simple model on the MNIST data set, which is the character recognition data set. And then uh, we're going to do something really cool. We're going to, using deep learning, build a similar dress recommender. Um, just to give you guys psyched, I'm going to uh, demonstrate how it's going to work. All right. So we're out of presentation mode, and we're in Google Chrome. OK, now let's go back to full screen. OK, so this is a, a simple front end wrapper on what we're building today. It was made by a few folks at Dotto. And I'm going to type a keyword, dress. And I have a bunch of dresses that come up. OK, let's make it a little bit bigger. Can you everybody see it? Yes? Are we good? OK, awesome. Um, and the way this works is you select one of these dresses, and it goes into a data set of uh, dress images, and it finds the most similar one. Uh, and it does so exclusively based on visual features. There's no uh, text metadata that's being used. And it's all powered by deep learning. So hopefully by the end of this tutorial today, uh, all of you will have a good understanding of how this works. All right, let's go back to the presentation. Um, exit full screen. I wish I knew better shortcuts. All right, are we back up? OK, so really, deep learning is all about features. So let's put this a little bit in context and uh, understand why features are so key to machine learning. Let's start with just like a really simple machine learning task, which is spam filtering. And what happened, the goal of the machine learning task of spam filtering is when a user opens an email, well, he or she thinks it's spam. So the input to this machine learning model might be just like the text of an email. It might be information about the user. So uh, what the user has thought was spam in the past, or it might be uh, information about the source. So whether or not the source has been flagged as spam in the past by other users. Um, then you put it into some model, and the model tries to learn whether uh, it's spam or not. It turns out that this um, can be a hard problem because the input is quite unstructured. So the text can be of arbitrary length, and many models require fixed length input. Um, there might be noisy data, like uh, in the text body, there might be words like a, the, and, which aren't very indicative of whether uh, the input is spam or not. And um, so, Usually, there's a little bit of pre-processing that has to go into the data before it gets consumed by the model. And this is often called feature extraction, or feature engineering. And feature engineering is one of those like black art things uh, in machine learning. And it's just transformation of the input data into something that the model can, can actually parse. And so that can be as simple as just pulling out important words in this example, or it can be a, like a very complex transformation of the input into some new form. Uh, so quite a lot of machine learning research in the past years has been exactly on how to best perform this feature extraction. But what makes deep learning so amazing is that it's uh, all about learning those features without having to know much about them. So to really understand why learning features is so cool and so important, let's take a step back and uh, look at linear classifiers. Uh, linear classifiers are the most common type of classifier. So if you've ever played with SVMs or logistic regression, those are linear classifiers. And what they do is they take some space uh, which is filled with positive and negative examples, and they try to draw a line between the positive and negative examples such that 
all positive examples are one, on one side of the line and all negative examples are on the other. And so in uh, multiple dish dimensions, this line is called a hyperplane. And a, this line or hyperplane is parameterized by what we see here as uh, W1 and W2. And uh, so anytime W1 times X1 plus W2 times X2 plus some bias term equals zero, um, that's the decision boundary. If it's ever greater than zero, it's positive examples. And if it's ever less than zero, it's negative examples. Okay, so that's cool. Um, it seems quite simple, but still, uh, a linear classifier can represent quite a lot of things. It can solve quite a lot of problems. Um, one example all of you folks are probably familiar with is the logical AND. So this is like, uh, this is a graphical representation of a logical AND. On the y-axis, we have the potential variables, or the potential values, sorry, of um, one variable. And on the x-axis, we have the potential values of the other variable. And if they're both one, then uh, the, and it's a positive example. So one logical and one is true, otherwise it's false. And so we display this graphically and we can draw a line between the negative examples and the positive examples. So that's cool. Uh, if you have an or, you can do the same thing. In this case, it's only negative or false if both inputs are zero. But what happens when you have something like this? This is the XOR function. Uh, so the XOR function is only true when only a, one of the input values is true. And so we can't represent this with a linear classifier. We can't learn this with a linear classifier. So we either need a nonlinear classifier or we need nonlinear features. So we need to embed this data in a new space where you can use a linear classifier. And that might look a little like this. So it's just a transformation of the input. And with this new transformed input, you can draw a line between positive and negative examples. OK, so how do we go about solving this problem, this feature extraction problem? Let's start with looking at a graph representation of the classifier, the linear classifier we were just looking at. You'll, we'll find that it's pretty useful for defining neural networks and uh, for our understanding of how feature extraction can work. Um, so on the left, we have our input vector, uh, x1 through xd. You can see that the 1 and the 2 and the d got cut off a little bit, but that's what they are. And the output is the y. OK? So remember that a linear classifier is basically a weighted sum of the input units here. Um, so w1 times x1 plus w2 times x2, et cetera. So let's represent that graphically. So we have w1 times x1, w2 times x2, et cetera. And then you threshold it so that if the output is greater than 0, it's a true or a positive example. If it's less than 0, it's a negative example. OK? There's also a bias term. So let's use this uh, sort of representation to go back and revisit our logical, uh, bo our Boolean operators. OK, so what weights would we need to put on these edges to get uh, an x1 or x2? Does anybody know? OK. Um, basically, if you put in weights of 1s on the edges connecting x1 and x2 to y, and uh, negative 0 0.5 connecting to the bias term, you get the OR function. And it, so it works a little like this. Uh, if you always have this value of 1 uh, times negative 0.5 going into the y, and if either x1 
or x2 are positive, or both, they, um, it brings up the value above zero, and so the, the result is true. If, however, neither x1 nor x2 are true, then those values get set to zero, and so the only input that coming into the uh, y is one times negative 0.5. So it's less than zero, and the, uh, the result is false. So let's repeat this exercise for and. Uh, any ideas for this one? Oh, okay. So it's going to be one, one, and negative 1.5. In this case, only if both x1 and x2 have values of 1 will uh, the y output value be greater than 0 or true. So that sort of matches our expectations for how Boolean operators work. So let's go back to this idea of feature extraction and uh, so solving the XOR problem. Um, so we can rewrite XOR with x1 and not x2, or not x1 and x2. Okay, so this is just Boolean algebra. And this is breaking it, our problem down into portions which we already know how to solve. So that's, let's call that z1, we already know how to solve that. That's z2, we already know how to solve that. And this is our familiar uh, input on the left and output on the right. Okay, so let's uh, put in z1. This is very similar to what we were just looking at. So the only difference is that this x2 connection weight is negative one because of the not. Okay, let's do uh, z2. Now we threshold those and we can just or the resulting z values and get our answer. So that is uh, x1, xor, x2. And does, does this look familiar to anybody, this sort of representation? Well, this is exactly what a, a neural network looks like. The only difference is we handpicked our values that connects um, units because it was a relatively straightforward problem. But neural networks, given an input and a target output, learn those parameters. Okay? So, uh, this is, they're really cool. Um, it turns out that neural nets, that with enough hidden units, they can model any arbitrary function. So, that's why you've been seeing so many amazing results uh, out of research that has to do with deep learning. But it also comes at a cost. So neural nets are really difficult to train. Uh, as the number of hidden units grow, those numbers of connections grow as well. And so that many parameters takes too much memory and too much computation time to train. Okay, so we have GPUs to the rescue. Um, neural nets, many operation in the neural net training can be parallelized. Basically, neural net training essentially reduces to matrix multiplications, and that can be easily parallelized on a GPU. Uh, nevertheless, it's still computationally intensive, so many of the really performant networks out there have maybe 20 layers, amazing amounts of layers, maybe tens of millions of parameters. And so even with GPUs, it can take on the order of months to train. So this idea of convolutional neural nets came along. And uh, there's a few different approaches to understanding convolutional neural nets. But one of them is that it's a strategic removal of edges. So let's take a standard fully connected layer, which is very similar to what we saw before, where all the units in the input layer are connected to all the units in the hidden layer, okay? Um, and so, turns out that if, in many cases, 
a lot of those uh, parameters are learned to be zero. So you can remove them. And so now we have just locally connected units. That's nice. We've reduced the number of parameters we need. But we can go even further. We can tie weight values. So in this case, all the red edges share a weight, all the blue edges share a weight, and all the green edges share a weight. And you can interpret that as basically a filter moving along the input and filling out the hidden layer. And this is, I have a little GIF here of what it might look like in two dimensions on an actual image. Okay, so it's moving along and filling out the, the hidden layer. Um, you can sort of see these kernels as detectors. So maybe they're moving around the input and they're trying to detect an edge or maybe they're trying to detect a cat face or something. But that, that's an easy way of, of thinking about what's going on. Okay, so another type of layer, which is quite common in neural nets, is a pooling layer. And so what a pooling layer does is it takes a neighborhood and it reduces it to one value. Um, so what this does is it allows you to gain a certain amount of robustness to the spatial location of features. So for instance, uh, if you're looking for a face in an image, it, doesn't, it might not really matter where the face is. Um, so you want the response of the layer to be identical even with small shifts of the input. Um, so another side effect of this pooling is that if you alternate convolution and pooling, um, you sort of, the pooling zooms out uh, each time you perform a pooling. And the next convolutional layer is working on a different scale. So at the beginning, it might be working on a very small scale. It might, the filters might be looking for things like edges. And then later on, uh, they might be looking for things like faces. So much larger spatially. So I have another GIF here of what this pooling might look like. Um, as you can see, it takes a neighborhood and reduces it to one value. Okay. So you aggregate all these kinds of layers into one network and you get one very complicated thing. This is the uh, AlexNet. Some of you may be familiar with it. This is the network that won the ImageNet challenge a few years ago. And the key thing to notice here is just like we were talking about, uh, first there is convolution, then there's pooling, then there's convolution, then there's pooling, so there's that alternating scheme. And then at the end you have some fully connected layers just to um, sort of fully integrate the information that was learned during the convolution. Okay, so let's move on. Any questions? No? Okay. So let's move on. The biggest area that deep learning has made a contribution to uh, in the most mature sort of deep learning field is computer vision. And so let's dive into that a little bit deeper. So an example of a computer vision task might be to try and f uh, detect a face in an image. And if you wanted to make an algorithm that did that, just with raw input pixels, that'd be quite hard. Um, I certainly can't think of just one off the top of my head. But if you had uh, annotations of the image, so you said that, okay, there's a nose in the image, there's two eyes, and there's a mouth, uh, then I could even just write a simple expression like if nose and two eyes and mouth, then face. So that's the idea behind image features, uh, behind visual features. In reality, annotating images like that is really expensive. Uh, so what the standard image classification approach might be, take some input, you extract features algorithmically in some way, whether it's using uh, like some sort of gradients, optical flow, et cetera. 
And then plugging those, the results into a simple classifier like um, a linear classifier like we were talking about earlier. So that, that's better than hand annotating images. It's algorithmic, but these features, they're still handcrafted uh, in the sense that they're not learned. And they're very painful to design, and you have to be an expert, and the features that you might apply aren't necessarily uh, applicable to the domain or the task that you want to solve. Okay, so maybe we can change the image classification approach. The question is, can we actually learn these features from the data instead of using these hand designed ones? And the answer is, of course, yes. Um, you can use a neural network to learn features. So it turns out that using a neural network like the one we were just describing, the AlexNet, uh, you can feed it raw images and along the way, within the, inside the network, it learns a hierarchy of features. So at first, it learns edges and sort of corners. Then, if the task is to identify faces, it might learn parts of faces, um, nose, mouth, eyes. And then it assembles those parts into a, like higher level ideas. And this is really powerful. We've gotten really good results. Uh, we've seen really good results, for instance, on things like traffic sign recognition. And uh, so that's just driving around, taking pictures of, of traffic signs, recognizing what they are. Um, the Google house number competition, where you drive around and take photos of um, just house numbers. But really, what was most astounding was uh, about, I guess, three years ago now, uh, there was a group from Google uh, with Alex Krzyzewski. They made this network, which I introduced to you earlier, that had 60 million parameters. And they um, applied it to the ImageNet competition. And the ImageNet competition is basically an object uh, classification competition where given basically images scraped off of the internet um, of a thousand different categories, you try to recognize what they are. So they're natural images, they're not curated. There's a whole mass of them. The training set for the challenge was 1.2 million images. And it turns out with that amount of data and on that kind of problem, their network just totally annihilated everybody else in the competition. So. You can see on the left, uh, that's the error rates for at the AlexNet, and everything else is at least 10% higher. So it's like 15% error rate versus 25% error rate for all other previous state of the art. So that's a pretty big deal. It's really cool. Um, of course, uh, even in computer vision, you might have different applications of deep learning. Um, one might be scene parsing, so taking an image and sort of segregating it into what the different parts are. And so that's, these results are only qualitative, but it's really impressive. Um, the question is then, if deep learning is so good and so awesome, um, are there any challenges? So far we have seen that um, Deep learning enables learning of features rather than like hand construction. We've seen that there's really impressive gains on tasks in computer vision and other tasks. And it seems like there's potential for a lot more impact. So what are the cons? Well, let's uh, dive in a little bit into how the workflow looks like for constructing a deep learning model. First, you have to get lots of label data. It's really important to have lots of label data, otherwise the network um, doesn't know what to do. Okay, then you train, uh, you split the, the data set into a training set and a validation set. Then you learn a deep neural net. Then you try to validate it, and it probably didn't work. So you go back, you add data, you adjust hyperparameters, you change the model architecture, um, 
And it's just a very time-consuming process. Uh, so you have to be an expert in the field. You have to have lots of time. You have to have lots of com uh, computational resources for this to work, really. So can we do better? Well, let's go back to this learned hierarchy that uh, we discussed earlier. And let's assume that instead of looking for uh, classification of faces, we're trying to classify um, of human faces. Let's say we're trying to classify alien faces. And uh, alien faces, it turns out, also have noses and eyes and mouths. It's just that the mouth might be on the top of the head and the eyes on the bottom. We already have detectors for eyes and mouths, so shouldn't we be able to reuse the information here? And so the answer is yes. And that is uh, what deep features are. It's the, the idea of taking deep learning and applying transferred learning to deep learning. So let's go ahead and define transfer learning. Transfer learning is the idea of using data from one domain or training on uh, human faces to learn, help learn on another. Okay, so training on alien faces. And the workflow looks a little something like this. You have lots of data. You train the neural net which has really good accuracy because somebody has spent the time to tune it. We ha do have the appropriate amount of data, et cetera. And so now that neural net learned really rich descriptions of the data. And so we use it as a feature extractor. Now we can, using this, uh, these extracted features on some new task where you only have a little bit of data, you can apply just a simple classifier and get great accuracy on a new problem. So uh, let's dive a little bit deeper into that. So what's learned in a neural net? OK, well, the very last layer is just a linear classifier, as we saw earlier. And so that's very specific to the original task. But in order to be a good classifier, internally the network had to learn very, a very rich representation of an image. And that rich representation can be used for a variety of tasks. So what you do is you propagate an image forward through the network and you chop off either the last layer or maybe the last two layers and you end up with a vector representation of uh, an image. Then on the new task, you can plug in that vector representation into a simple classifier and get good results. Okay, so this was explored using this AlexNet architecture that I was describing. It turns out that this network turned on a million Im trained on a million images of about a thousand classes, uh, makes a surprisingly general feature extractor. And this was first explored by uh, Jeff Donahue et al. in a paper called DCAF. OK. So let's dig into the workflow a little bit. So transfer learning with deep features. You only have a little bit of labeled data. You extract the features. You split into a training and validation set. You learn a simple model. You validate it, and it just works. In real life, this is an example of an instance where uh, deep features did really work. The task was to discriminate whether or not a trash can was full or not. That was certainly not in the training set of ImageNet, and yet using deep features and a classifier, you could get quite good results. Okay, so what else can we do with deep features? We have these nice vector representations of images. Okay, well, you could find similar images. Does this look familiar? And how do you do that? Well, basically, if, two, if we have a good, semantically meaningful uh, representation of each image, 
if two images are visually and conceptually similar, for us, they should also be close in this embedding space. And so you could simply do like a nearest neighbors search to find similar images. And that's what we'll end up doing. Okay, so the last step of all this is you have a nice model. Maybe it serves up uh, similar images and it's quite practical. So you wanna send it off to the world. And so you wanna deploy it. How do you do that? Well, first you train this model, okay? And then you might wanna put it up to the cloud where it can serve real-time predictions and you can access it maybe uh, using a REST API. So that's what we'll be doing in our tutorial as well. So in summary, deep learning is a really exciting machine learning development, but it's hard to use, it's slow, there's lots of tuning needed. Uh, by applying transfer learning to deep learning, you get deep features, so you can reuse deep models for new domains, and it turns out you need less data, faster training times, and much simpler tuning while preserving excellent performance. Okay, so next, we'll, we're going to go ahead and build a deep learning model and create an image similarity service. But before we move on, I just wanted to get a final count of how people are doing on the installation front. So has everybody gotten data and installed? Yes? Okay, let's, uh, let's move right along then. If you need help at any point, just raise your hand and somebody will come to you. Great. All right, so now we're going to tran tran just transition over to uh, the IPython notebooks. Okay, so I'm going to, let's make this bigger. Can you guys see that? Whoops. Um, all right, so I'm going to open up, I have on my desktop uh, the PyData Seattle directory. I'm going to open it up and in there you should see uh, these three directories. Now I'm going to activate my conda environment for .odeb, so source activate Dotto env. Okay. And I'm going to spin up IPython notebook. Sure. Um, and so, yeah, that's just. Once you open up IPython or IPython notebook, this is to make sure that everything is healthy within GraphLab Create. Okay. Can you guys see that? All right. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and move on. If you need these instruct or this these instructions, this code snippet, it's also in this link, which should be accessible from the abstract on the PyData page. Okay. Enter presentation. Let's make this big. All right. Um, open up. I'm going to open up the Deep Learning Basics IPython notebook. Okay, is that a good size for everybody? It looks like it's pretty big. Great. So in this first portion of the tutorial, we're going to get uh, our hands dirty with the GraphLab Create software, creating a uh, deep learning model trained on character, on, on basically digit recognition. So the task is to recognize digits. They're from zero to nine. And uh, it's part of the MNIST data set, which some of you may be familiar with. And just to sort of motivate this problem, this 
sort of application was one of the first successful applications of deep neural nets in computer vision. So back in the 90s, uh, this kind of thing was used when, within ATMs to read uh, checks that were put in ATMs. So pretty important and quite successful there. So uh, just one really quick IPython notebook tutorial. Uh, your guys's is filled out, and if you want to run a line, you can simply click on a code box, hit shift enter, and it should execute. Excellent. Okay, so training a, a deep uh, learning model basically consists of four phases. Phase one is loading in the data, then you train the model, then you evaluate the model and maybe go on to improve it. So let's start and load in the data. Let's call the training data the train and do graphlab.sframe mnist train, which is in that directory archive. Okay. An S frame is basically a scalable data frame. It scales out of core, and so it is a big enabler for a lot of our toolkits. Let's take a look at this training data. It looks like it has two columns. Uh, one is label, one is image. If we want to take a look at the image, we can do something like this, train.show, and that opens up our visualization tool or uh, graph lab canvas. If we transition to the table, you can see that the label column corresponds with the image, and you can also see that many of these Handwritten digits uh, are not so well written. Maybe some people's handwriting is not as good as others. So it makes it a pretty realistic data set. All right, let's transition back to the notebook. Whoops. OK. Also uh, important is the validation set. So let's load that in. Dot S frame, and it's called MNIST dot test dot graph lab. Uh oh, I think I didn't make it a string. That's better. Okay, and the validation set is important because anytime you want to evaluate a model, you want to make sure it's on data the model has never seen before. Uh, because that's where most likely your, what the task your model will most likely be performing is uh, looking at data it's never seen before. So you want to make sure it does well there. So let's take a look there. There's an additional ID column um, that's in order to for some something later down the line. But it also contains the label column and the image column, so it's consistent with uh, the training set. Okay, so we've loaded in the data. Now is time to train the model. It's uh, not too difficult. Let's assign it to neural net model equals graph lab dot neural net classifier dot create. Okay, and then so we have to pass in the training set. We also need to pass in the target or what we want the model to learn. So in this case, that's the label. We want the model to learn what each digit is. The next thing we should pass in is the validation set. So the schema of the validation set should match the input set, so we only select two columns. So it's going to be validation, uh, whoops. And also, so in your guys' notebooks, the validation set is equal to none, and we do perform evaluation later. But that's okay. We also uh, want, might want to see how the model validates as it's training. So let's select image and label. And then I guess one last thing that I'm going to set is max iterations. So an iteration is the number of passes through the data the algorithm does. The more passes, 
the more accurate the algorithm is in general, but um, the more time it takes. So it's a trade-off. OK, let's, uh, let's run this and see how it does. So what's happening right now is it's generating an architecture and then actually performing the training. So you can see that the, the generated architecture here is, has seven layers. Um, you might ask how it was generated. Well, it was just uh, based on the data, it selects the same default. So if the data is image data, it selects a convolutional neural net. If it's uh, just vectors, it might choose a neural net without convolutional uh, layers. And let's explore the, drain, the training statistics a little bit. Um, maybe I'll zoom out because the formatting is a little off. Can you still see? OK. So we can see we had three iterations, about 5,300 examples in each iteration. Each uh, iteration took a few seconds. And the training accuracy jumped significantly. Um, and the validation accuracy is actually quite good. It's better than training accuracy, which is interesting. So in the end, we end up with an 81% training accuracy and an 89.9% validation accuracy. And uh, we get a few thousand examples per second as throughput. If you were to run this with, one of the, with a GPU, using our GPU egg, you'd see really significant speed ups. But anyways, I wanted to give you guys maybe a minute to play around uh, specifically with the max number of iterations. If you haven't caught up to here, you can click on the cell, click cell, and hit run all above. So why don't we take just a minute? And if you have any issues, once again, uh, why don't you grab our TAs? Raise your hand. All right. I, in the meantime, I can take questions. Yeah. So this is trying to use a, a single thread. Yeah. yeah. So there are advantages to using multiple threads. Uh, primarily that it's faster. Uh, but so that is something on our roadmap right now. Yeah. Another question. Okay. You would like me to scroll up? Anything? Sorry, could you repeat the question? I see. So basically, the, the validation set has to have the same schema as the, the training set. So if you see, if we take a look here, you can see the validation has ID, label, and image, while train has only label and image. And so uh, basically, you're just pulling out the image and the label columns by passing in uh, a list. Yeah. Yeah, another question? Uh, perhaps I missed it, but how do you decide the structure of the layer? Like how many layers? I see. Yeah, so it's, it's a fairly straightforward heuristic. Basically, if uh, there is an image as the type, uh, it'll choose a convolutional network that we see here. Um, otherwise, if it's a vector type, which our S-frame supports, then it chooses a, a different architecture without the convolutional layers. It's just some fully connected layers. Um, I'm going to have to move on, but uh, I'll take more questions towards the end. Um, did anybody find anything interesting when playing around with the max iterations at all? Uh, so what I was hoping you guys would see at least was um, that as the number of iterations progress, so in this case epochs and iterations are interchangeable, the error goes down really rapidly at first, but not as rapidly after. And so the takeaway message here is, if you're just playing around with a neural net, trying to get the right architecture, or this or that or the other, making your data correct, um, use only a few iterations at first. And then once you're actually using this 
um, network out in the wild, train it for as many iterations as you need. Okay. So that's nice. Uh, we have trained a model. It seems to do fairly well on the, the, eval the validation set. Uh, let's take a deeper look at how well this model is actually doing. Okay, so we have this neural net model. And let's ev call invoke evaluate and put in the validation set as a parameter. Oh, maybe it's just validation. Okay, it's just validation. Okay, and we see that we get about 90% accuracy, which is what you saw before. But the other thing that comes up when you evaluate is the confusion matrix. And the confusion matrix basically tells you what categories are getting confused with what categories. Uh, it is a matrix, so this is in sort of a, a table form, but let's investigate it, the, uh, the model and this confusion matrix using GraphLab Canvas. It'll be a little bit more parsable. So neural net model, dot show, okay, and that should, you should be able to open up the GraphLab Canvas page and it should refresh. You can tab over to evaluation and you can take a look at the confusion matrix. So on the left, we have the real true labels and on up high, we have the labels that are uh, predicted by the model. So for example, in 963 instances, the model predicted a zero and it was actually a zero. But uh, in two instances, the model predicted a zero, but it was actually a three. So ideally, you would see high values across the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. And this might give you a little bit inside, insight into what the model is really learning and if the, confu the, in, the um, mistakes it's making are ones that you care about. So let's dive a little deeper and look for the high numbers off the diagonal. And we can see that in 101 cases, uh, the model thought it was a seven, but it really was a nine. And that might make sense uh, because a nine without that little circle at the top being written very clearly is, might actually look quite similar to a seven, even to a human. So it makes sense. Um, but we can still investigate a little bit further. I'm going to go ahead and go back to the notebook. So here I have a helper function that finds the misclassifications in the data. Um, so it basically runs, predicts the entire validation set and then finds where the true label does not match the, um, the, the predicted label. So let's define that and then find misclassifications with this model and with this validation data. So validation neural net model. Okay, so while that, let's take a look at what misclassifications actually are. Okay, so you can see in the left hand column, you have the label. So that's the true value. And the class column, you have what the model thought the image was. And then in the right hand most column, you have the score. And the score is basically just a confidence prediction by the model of what, of, of how confident the model is in this prediction. So if it's zero, then the model is extremely inconfident in the prediction it's making are unconfident, sorry. And if it's one, it's extremely confident. It's a range from zero to one, it's a probability score. Okay, so what we're really interested in is those cases where the model is really confident, but maybe actually isn't correct. So let's sort by 
the score. Okay, so I'm going to do misclassifications.sort. Sorting by score, and I'm going to do ascending equals false. And all that does is it sorts in reverse order. Okay, so sorted misclassifications, and we can see that now it is indeed sorted with the highest confidences towards the top. Is everybody with me? Yeah? Okay, cool. So this is still not that insightful. Um, we may want to actually look at the images that are getting misclassified. So let's go back to Canvas again and explore. Okay. So we can see that, for instance, in this top row, um, model thought it was a two, it was actually a seven. But when you look at the image itself, I honestly might have made that same mistake. So I don't know, I, I feel like that's okay. But there are some cases where the model is very clearly wrong. Uh, for instance, in row four here, it thinks uh, it's a three but it's very clearly a five. So maybe the model has a little bit of room for improvement. So that's gonna be our, our next topic here, um, is how to go about improving a neural net model. Let's go do that. Okay, so this is a graphic that I was introduced to um, a few months back. I, it was presented uh, by Andrew Ying, and it's a very, it's a basic recipe for machine learning with respect to deep learning in particular. And so you, let's go through this little flow chart. First, let's ask the question, does it do well on the training data? If no, then you need a bigger network. And the reason for that is maybe um, the network you made is not expressive enough to, come, to, to capture the mapping from the input to the output. And so, like we discussed, a neural net can model any function so long as it has enough hidden units. So you might just want to add more hidden units. Okay, all right, but let's say it does do well on the training data. If it does well on some test data as well, then you're done, for now at least. And uh, if it if does not do well on the test data, then you might need to add more data. And the reason is, if you have a very expressive model, it might capture sort of random noise in the training set. Uh, for instance, in the case of sevens, some people write sevens with a strike through them, some people write sevens without a strike through them, and the, if the training set contains only sevens with a strike through them, a very expressive model might think that only things with a strike through them are sevens. And so when it gets hit with a seven without the strike, it's confused. And so the solution there is either add sevens without a strike to the training set or make the model a little bit smaller uh, so that it doesn't capture that, that little piece of information. And so that effect of capturing random noise in the training set is called overfitting. Here's a nice little graphic that, that deals with that. Um, so basically, at a certain point, even though your training error keeps going down, your test error starts diverging. And so that's a, a really important indicator of overfitting. So there's one more solution to overfitting that I didn't mention earlier. It's a little bit hacky, but it works. Um, is if you're monitoring the difference between the training error and the test error, and they start diverging at any point, you can just stop the training right there. And if you're happy with the performance at that point. So that's that. Um, Maybe we have a little bit of time so we can explore a little bit how to 
uh, increase the network size in our case and sort of play with the network size. So let's do that. I'm going to assign new network to, I'm going to pull out the topology of the neural net model we created. Okay, so it's that neural net model and then in square brackets, it's network. Okay, so new network. You can see this uh, topology that we were looking at earlier. And we want to identify a spot where you can increase the number of layers. Um, so we discussed convolutional layers, max pooling layers, and fully connected layers. Uh, convolutional layers, you can increase the number of parameters there uh, by increasing the number of convolutional filters or channels. So in each convolutional layer, remember we had a little filter roaming around, but in each layer you might have multiple. So we could play with the number of channels. Um, we can also play with just the number of hidden units in a fully connected layer, like in layer three. Here. So if we increase that, the network becomes more expressive. Um, one key thing is this last fully connected layer uh, connects the output. And the final number of units must match the number of the uh, sorry, the number of classes in the task. So in this case 10. So that's a, a little bit off limits for us right now. Okay, so let's let's play with layer three, just as a, really it's an arbitrary choice. Um, now, now, so let's do this. New network, okay, then we can pull out, there's a layers attribute, which is just a list of the layers. We have an index, we were talking about the third layer, okay, so then we can do graph Flab dot deep learning dot layers. So it's a layers module, and there's a full connection layer object constructor. And you pass into that constructor the number of hidden units that you want. We previously had uh, 100, so let's up that to 500. Okay, and so let's take a look at our new network. Oops. Okay, so you can see in layer three, we now have 500 units, whereas previously we had 100 units. So I'm gonna type out uh, the command for how to train this guy. So let's do improved network equals graphlab.neuralnet classifier.create. And then it's going to be train, and then target, once again, equals label. This is just verbatim what we had earlier. Um, validation set equals validation. OK, and once again, it was, I believe it was image and label. Whoops. Okay, and the last thing, we have max iterations equal to three. And the last thing is we want to set the network um, parameter to equal that new network that we set. Okay, so let's train it. And I'll give you guys uh, a few minutes to experiment with this, maybe a minute or two. Maybe you want to dig into evaluating model and if you have any questions or problems once again um, raise your hand TA will come by if you have a question for me I can answer that as well so let's, let's take like a in fact let's take a, a maybe a five minute break if you guys want to go to the restroom or something too so okay go for it <laughs> Layer, or is it, or it be, uh, 
It's probably going to be more than that, right? Because uh, it's really the number of connections that you care about. And so that's quadratic, I believe, right? Because it's, it's, like it's like an inner product. Oh, okay. Yeah. OK. Can you check if people are still having installation issues to raise their hand? OK. Yeah, guys, if you're still having installation issues, raise your hand. We'll have people come by. Where would you like me to scroll back up to? This right here? No. We'll start back up in two minutes. Yes. Uh huh. From the from the documentation, it looks like it's using random voice to initialize. Yeah, I get the same result. Yeah, so it is. I mean, it's random weights, but I'm guessing. It's it's. Okay, there's two possibilities here. I don't actually know the answer. Either it's random weights, but there's a seed to it, um, which I don't think is the case, or there's, it actually is learning uh, the same thing each time, which on a small problem like this is, seems like it's not unlikely. Yeah. You know, I'm not sure if I... I'll, I, I'll have to ask some folks if I can. Oh, I see. I'd, I'd like love a to. confidential company data? Maybe. I don't know. Okay. We'll see. All right. <laughs> All right, folks. Let's get, let's get started. Um, so we just got a little glimpse of what it's like to train a neural net. Uh, this was a fairly small problem. Uh, but as your problems get bigger and bigger, the, the procedure takes longer and longer. and it becomes much more challenging. So we're going to dive into using uh, an already trained model on ImageNet um, to use that model as a feature extractor and to actually go ahead and build that similar uh, dress retriever. Uh, so let's navigate away from this particular notebook and then you can go up a directory level, and there's a, another directory called image similarity search. Okay, and let's open up that notebook. Has everybody been able to find the notebook there? Yes, yes, okay. If no, please feel free to interrupt and let me know. All right, so in, in this notebook, we're going to go ahead and build that dress re retriever, uh, sorry, image similarity model. And so that basically takes four steps. First, we're going to load in the data again. Then we're going to extract the features like we were t discussing um, with the AlexNet model. Then finally, we're going to calculate distances between the different uh, examples in the training set, and then find the sim most similar items so you can retrieve them. OK, so let's call this data image SF. And it's located in the 
Is my, I may not have imported graph lab. That's an important first step. All right. And that's going to be in the data directory. So if it's one directory level up, so it's data slash um, sf underscore process dot s frame. Okay. So has everybody been able to load in that s frame? Great. Um, let's explore it. Let's take a look at it. Okay. So we can see that it has a number of columns. One is ID, which is just an identifier. Then we have a name column, uh, a brand column, a price, and an image column. So uh, all of these columns are actually quite informative, but we're going to focus on the image one. Uh, so let's take a look at that. Okay. So it just, ooh, okay. Uh, well, you could see that it had images of dresses. Uh, and so that's what we're recommending and uh, serving up. So that makes sense. Okay. So we've loaded in the data. Now uh, we're going to extract features. And so the thing we need for that is we need that pre-trained model. And so remember that this is the AlexNet model. Um, which is the one in this graphic here and the one I described in the presentation. Graphlab.load model. It's going to be a string, relative path, data, and it's going to be called the ImageNet model. Okay. Let's take a look at what's in there. Dun dun dun. It's a fairly large model, so it might take a minute to load. What's that? I see. Okay, thank you for the tip. I guess it got uh, confused with that image column. Let's go back to the image similarity notebook. Okay. Maybe I'm going to kill it and then restart it. Well then, uh, so once this loads, we'll be able to continue with the procedure of extracting the features using the model. Um, all right, I'm going to go ahead and restart the kernel and try again. Restart. One, we are loading in the S frame again. And let's load the pre-trained model. There we go. Perfect. So we have this pre-trained model. Uh, we can see that it was trained on uh, 1.2 million examples. It got a training accuracy of 62%, uh, which seems bad, but for such a hard task, it's quite good. It was state of the art several years ago, and it took many thousands of seconds to train. So it was a few days. So it's a good thing we're not uh, having to retrain it right now. Somebody has done it for us. Um, and the next thing that I wanted to look at is just the model architecture. OK, so we can pull out the network topology. OK, and you can see that it has convolutional layers, followed by pooling layers, followed by convolutional layers, so on and so forth. And you can see that it's quite large. It's much bigger than the network that, that we trained in the previous uh, section of the session. And then there's some other training parameters, such as learning rate, here. OK. So we have this network. We have the data. Let's try extracting a feature. So I'm going to do example feature equals pre-trained model dot 
extract features. Okay, and so the important thing here is that you only do uh, one image or else it might lock up your IPython notebook session. It's a very big model. It takes a lot of effort to pump uh, several thousand images through. And if we had a GPU, it would take um, maybe a few minutes, maybe a minute or two, but with a CPU, it can take quite a while, maybe upwards of a half hour. So if you're going to be doing this for a lot of images, uh, be sure to either have some time or put, do it on a GPU. Uh, we support multiple GPUs now, or maybe distribute it with some map job. Okay, so let's see what this example feature looks like. And it's uh, not very interpretable, but it is a, a vector representation like we were discussing. Um, and this is what the computer uses to, to represent the image. Uh, just to just for fun, let's take a look at the length of the example feature. Whoops. Uh, example feature zero. And you can see that it's 4096 dimensional. And if we go back to the network, uh, we're extracting from the second to last layer, where the number of hidden units is 4096. So the, the dimensionality of the vector makes sense. OK, so in this next code block where it's commented out, that's how you would extract the features uh, of the entire S frame. But we've done that already for you because of the, the time constraints. So let's take a look at the image SF once more. And you can see that there's a features column. OK. So is, is everyone with me here? Has everybody been able to extract a feature from a single example? OK. Um, if feel, once again, feel free if you have the need to interrupt me at any time. All right. So we have these extracted features. Now we want to be able to both calculate the distances uh, between these vector representations of all the images in our S frame and uh, retrieve similar items for particular queries. So let's do that. Uh, so we want to create a nearest neighbors model. So it's gra once again, it's the same API. It's uh, nearest graphlab.nearestNeighbors dot create. OK, and then we have uh, our image SF is what we're creating the nearest neighbors model on. And we're only using the, uh, the features column. All the, uh, so that is what we pass in to this features parameter right here. And so let's go ahead and create the model. Excellent. So now we can sort of look at the model. You can see that it's a nearest neighbors model with uh, the, the training set has 7,000 examples and there were 4,096 features or the dimensionality of the features. OK, any questions? Everybody following? Good. So now let's, uh, let's put this into action. Let's pull out. Uh, an image. This one in particular is one that we've selected beforehand because it's nice and blue. So let's take a look. OK, so we have a blue dress. And we want to retrieve similar dresses for that blue dress. So we can do something like. Uh, nearest neighbors model dot query. And then uh, we can do blue. And then let's, uh, how many nearest neighbors do we want? 
Just give me a number. Five nearest neighbors? Great. Excellent. So, retrieved, calculated all the pairs, pairwise distances. Now let's take a look at the output. And um, we have IDs and distances. So, I have a little helper function here, which given this sort of uh, output, goes ahead and takes these IDs, which correspond to the row ID of the original S frame, and join that back. And then, since with that join, um, we lose the, the order, we sort it based on distance again. So let's go ahead and do that. Whoops. And let's say return equals retrieve images labels, okay, and see what happens, and then return. Okay, so we have uh, a few items here. Let's view it in Canvas again. Okay, so as we can see, um, we have five really similar blue addresses. So these deep features really do capture uh, visual similarity very well. Okay, I would like to invite all of you guys to go ahead and just spend a few minutes playing with uh, different examples and seeing, sort of proving to yourselves and seeing how it works for you. So. And if you have any questions, I'll take questions now. And also, uh, once again, the TAs are here to help. In the meantime, I'll start playing with it, too. Let's see if I can come up with anything interesting. Sure, sorry. Where would you like me to go? Here is fine? OK. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so that's, yeah, so that's, uh, that's definitely, I mean, so when we're measuring similarity of the image, we're not just focusing on the dress. Um, so that this doesn't deal with that right now. Um, but one way to deal with that might be to do some sort of background extraction procedure and then just pull out the dress and then do some sort of, um, some sort of sim a similar thing to this. And so there are some methods for background extraction and I believe OpenCV has some implemented that are quite good. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, sorry. Just out of curiosity, how is that this classified like the gold and white versus? <laughs> uh, so you'll see, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Sorry, the, the question is how does this classify the uh, the blue or gold dress question, right, uh, from a while ago. And we'll see that in an upcoming segment. So you'll see. Can someone ask a question about how it um, classifies the person as well, not just the dress? Right, so um, it, it sort of measures distances of the whole image. Sorry, the question is uh, whether or not the, the similarity metric incorporates not just the dress, but also the model wearing it? And the answer is yes. It takes the whole image. So similarities between models will uh, indeed contribute to the similarities between images. Uh, there are ways of dealing with this. For instance, you could ex uh, use some sort of background extraction mechanism to just pull out the dress and then do a similar procedure to this. Or alternatively, um, you could see. It's okay, it doesn't really matter. If you like the dress, you like the way it looks. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's true in this case, but in other cases it might not be. Yeah. Okay. Uh, has everybody gotten a chance to play around with this a little bit? Okay. Well, I wanted to look at uh, one more example just to sort of show that 
sometimes the uh, sometimes if you get really unique dresses or if the uh, there's not a whole lot of data to populate the similarity graph, you might get interesting results. So I'm going to go ahead and pull out this example here. OK, so let's go back to Canvas. And it's uploading. And you can sort of see that we have a waffle dress. Um, yeah, it's, it's sort of interesting. Now it's. It's made uh, even worse by the fact that the image is a little distorted right now, but let's see if there are any similar dresses. Okay, this is the wrong one. All right, so the, the command we had previously was, all right, labels equals nearest neighbor model dot query and then it's going to be uh, interesting and then let's let's retrieve maybe 20 nearest neighbors this time just for fun whoops that's a minus okay and uh, the name of the function that I just defined was retrieve images. So ants equals retrieve images of labels. Okay, and let's take let's investigate what kind of similar dresses we get. Okay, so it's it's not completely crazy. Um, we still pick up. I guess you can see a lot of the color, but uh, the dresses are not as similar, and that is most likely because there is just a fairly unique dress. But it is potentially also the case that maybe these deep features don't fully uh, capture what this dress is about, and so maybe there are other. Uh, dresses that are similar to this. So that would warrant investigating. Um, yeah, so that's, that's another thing. Uh, people frequently use cosine distances because it turns out that uh, the direction of the vector matters more than the magnitude of the vector. Uh, if you can imagine like maybe one element or one feature of the feature vector is like the blueness of a dress, um, it might not matter whether something is really, really, really blue or just mostly blue. And those differences in magnitude can be quite large. So you're right. Uh, a cosine distance is something that might work well here. And it is something we support. So we can even try it out um, if you guys want. Do you guys want to try out cosine distance? Yeah. All right, let's, let's, let's see if there's any difference. Um, so you have to do nearest neighbor model cosine uh, equals graphlab.nearest neighbors dot create image SF. OK, so this is identical to what we were doing before. Features equals features and distance equals cosine. OK? OK, so we uh, just constructed that. Let's just make sure that it's, it is actually a cosine distance there. Um, interesting. It doesn't say. Uh, but let's see. Uh, cosine and distance. Or maybe list fields. I'm kind of winging this right now. Okay, so we can. 
get the distance. Yeah, so it's a cosine distance. All right, so we can go back to this nearest neighbor model cosine query. And then we can uh, get those answers and show it. So, I don't know, do you guys think this is significantly different? It's a little bit different. I mean, we picked up a purple dress here, but it's, it's fairly similar. It's there's still, I guess, uh, one key thing that I've noticed is that especially when it comes to clothing, the, um, one of the key features this model picks up on is colors. So if uh, there's anything with a very like distinguishing color, then it, it will pick up on that, especially solid colors. Okay, so with that, um, we do have just a handful of exercises uh, if you want to try to give them a try, I'm going to give you guys just a few minutes to get started. Um, if, you, if you want, we can help answer questions about them. And uh, after that, so after let's say three or four minutes, um, we'll go back to actually going ahead and deploying this model so you can play with it yourself via a REST API. So let's, let's take a three or four minute break and I'll uh, I'll take questions now as well. No questions? So just to go through what these exercises are, the first exercise is to find the least similar to that blue dress that we found. Uh, the second is to find like the most average dress, and the third is to find the most unique dress. All of these are potentially interesting uh, results. I hope you guys got a chance to attempt at least some of these exercises, but we're going to move on to the next stage. Um, just to recap, in this section, we learned how to build a similar image service, um, which recommends or gives similar images to a query. It's using transfer learning, and so we have actually saw some really good results with the blue dress, and I hope you guys saw some other really nice results uh, when you got a chance to play around with it. Um, and before that, we also learned how to uh, just build a deep learning model. You can see that uh, it's really nice when somebody does it for you. And uh, it actually didn't take a whole lot of effort to come up with something that was quite meaningful and quite practical. So in the next stage of, of this tutorial, we're going to be talking about how to take the model you just built and uh, put it up into the cloud so you can query it from, a, uh, from any app, from, from any source. Okay, so I'm going to go up and go into this predictive service directory. And then I'm going to open up the predictive services IPython notebook. Okay, so we're going to be using data predictive services to uh, perform this task. So data predictive services is basically just a tool that allows you to package up any code you might have, whether it's scikit-learn, arbitrary Python code, maybe graph lab code, and put it into um, a cluster which is both scalable and robust and can be queried via a RESTful API. Uh, it can be on-premise or in the cloud or in EC2. And Performing such a, such a thing basically consists of three steps. The first step is creating a predictive object or a, a function that you push up to the predictive service. Then you stand up the predictive service, and then finally you query it. So 
in order to create a predict our predictive object here, the goal is given some URL, return URLs of similar images. So what we need to do for that is we need to have a pre-trained model. This is the neural net AlexNet model that we were using just in the previous section. And we also need the nearest neighbors model that we were using in the previous section. So I'm loading both of those in. Okay. In the next uh, little segment, I have a snippet of code. It's uh, basically a function which takes a URL, okay, and then it constructs a graph lab image out of that URL, resizes it. Uh, now this is important because neural nets only take fixed input, so and images tend to come in a variety of sizes. So the standard thing to do is to either crop or to warp them to that input size. And a fairly standard one is 256 to 200 by 256 by three. Okay, so then we take that graph lab image and uh, we put it in an S frame. We then go ahead and extract features from that image and then query the nearest neighbors model. This is identical to what we were doing just in the previous section. Uh, one little addition is we go ahead and we use the ID of the returning answers and concatenate a URL to it. And that's because we're actually hosting all of these images um, on S3 and we'll be able to reconstruct the images from the URLs instead of sending images over the wire um, or down from the predictive service, which can be quite expensive. Okay, so does, does everybody follow me with how that function works? Any questions? No? Okay, let's move on. So uh, I pulled just a query URL from the internet. Maybe some of you will recognize it. Uh, so let's take a look. So the, the question we're going to try to answer is <laughs> whether this is uh, blue or gold. I think this it looks quite blue on this screen, but you know, I don't know. What does the deep learning model think? Okay, so let, let's try to answer that question using this uh, predictive object that we created. Dress similar, query URL. Okay, and so what's happening is it's downloading the image and then extracting the features and then going through that process. Okay, so we have a list of URLs, image URLs, so now what we can do is we can apply a lambda function to this S frame and we we'll do this by calling out, pulling out this image URL, calling a dot apply on it, lambda x and graph lab dot image of x. And so what's happening here is for each item in this, uh, in this SRA, we're creating a new column where the value in that column is just an image that is reconstructed from each of these URLs. So let's go ahead and do that. Depending on the speed of the internet here, this might take just a moment because we're downloading images. Um, hey, it didn't seem too bad. And let's take a look at what our model thinks of blue and gold. Okay, it sees stripes primarily, neither blue nor gold, so even the model is confused. Um, but you can see, you can sort of get a sense for what kind of things 
uh, these models, these deep learning models pick up. Like I said, solid colors are often picked up and also patterns like stripes. And those are very distinctive things for the model. Okay, so we have, we have this function that will serve as our custom predictive object. And the next stage of being able to query uh, a predictive service is actually creating the predictive service. So here I have a, a set of commented lines and what they do is they stand up an EC2 cluster and create a predictive service on them. So I'm not going to run through this exactly in the interest of time, but I will, I will not run this in the interest of time, but I will walk through it. So the first thing you would do is you would set the credentials. Um, so if you have AWS credentials, you set them here. Then uh, you would create an EC2 environment. And within this constructor, this EC2 config constructor, you could pass in things like the type of instance you want to use, or the number of instances, or um, and things like that. And then we create a deployment with a graphlab.deploy.predictiveservice.create and we pass in a name and this configuration and also the, um, we also pass in a, a path for where the state will be stored. Okay, and so now we've created this predictive service and you might go ahead and add the custom predictive object and then apply those changes. So what I'm going to do is I'm, instead of standing up a predictive service like this, I'm going to go ahead and load one that already exists. So let's, let's try that. And let's take a look at it. Okay, so uh, this particular one has uh, a name of predictive, uh, predictive service tutorial DL2. It has this state path. Uh, one important bit is the API key. So if you want to access this uh, predictive service, this deployment from the outside world via RESTful API, you will need to provide this API key. Um, you can provide the API key within the construction of the predictive service or it can generate one for you. And then the last thing is uh, the load balancer DNS name. This will become part of the endpoint for the, the RESTful query, so that's important as well. All right, and here we, we can see that I was playing with the predictive service beforehand. It already has some objects, but uh, let's go ahead and put another one in. So let's do that. And then deployment.add. It's gonna be dress similar. That's the name of the predictive object. And then I'm also going to just pass in the name of the function that be defined earlier. Okay, so we have, uh, we've added it. Now we need to apply changes. Okay, and so this is taking just a moment because it needs to package up uh, the nearest neighbors model and the ImageNet model both of which are actually fairly large, especially the ImageNet model. Um, just, but just to point this out, this is kind of cool. It looks at your function that you're sending up and introspects it and sees what, what um, objects it needs to package up and pickle. Uh, so in this case, this pre-trained model is not defined within the function. It is uh, defined outside the scope of the function, but this uh, uploading of the predictive objects knows to go and grab the pre-trained model and the nearest neighbor's model. So that's kind of neat. And another interesting thing is that with these predictive services, you can use arbitrary Python packages. You just need to decorate the function with something like at required packages and provide a list but that's not necessary here at all. Okay, so we have 
uh, successfully uploaded these changes. Let's take a look at the status of the deployment and get an idea for what's going on. Okay, it looks like we've have a bunch of we've loaded successfully the uh, the dress similar object. It's version one, and we have a, a cache enabled. So if you have successive queries that are identical, it'll return them. They'll ser it'll serve back the answer very quickly. Okay, so we've stood up this predictive service in just a few lines of code. Um, now it's time to query it. We can query it using the GraphLab API. So the way you would do that is deployment.query and dress similar. And then you would pass in the parameters. So query URL. Is this making sense to everybody? Does anybody have any questions? No? OK. Let's see if this works. All right, and you get back in a JSON format a, uh, a list of images. That makes sense. Uh, so that's neat, but we really want to be able to access this from outside of Python. Maybe you're creating a JavaScript application or a mobile application, and you want to be able to create, uh, query this predictive object. And so we have some different um, bindings for uh, clients. So we have JavaScript and Java, I think, and Python that are, are just for that. But also, you can use any other way um, that you please for querying a RESTful API. So here I have a function which performs the RESTful query. Um, it takes a URL, and it queries this endpoint right here where the first substitution is the name of the, uh, the load balancer DNS, and the second substitution here is the name of the custom predictive object that we sent up. So this is runnable code for you guys. Uh, the only thing that you'll have to change is you folks have dress similar, and I have dress similar backup. We had to restart a predictive service, and uh, I didn't want to. And so I already had a custom predictive object loaded, but I wasn't able to load one in this segment of code here. Um, so just change that to backup. OK? And with that, we have a function for a RESTful query. Now we have, uh, we can query it. So let's do that and take a look at the response. So we have a response, once again, of a list of image URLs. So this is really cool. Um, we've done it totally without GraphLab Create. We can do this anywhere. And then, with this response, we want to be able to investigate it to just take a look at the answers. Um, we're going to load it back into an S-frame because Canvas is nice to look at things. So this helper function takes that response and uh, sticks it back in an S-frame. OK, so let's take a look. Do, do, do. So it might, I don't know what's going on. What's, OK, there we go. So we have images. It was downloading images. Cool. Then let's take, take a look and see if the answer matches. That you, query URL I gave was the blue and gold dress. So let's see if it matches what we had at the beginning of this section. OK, yeah, so it's the exact same answer. I'd like to invite you guys to spend a few minutes just querying this guy. And you can find any image off the internet that's a JPEG or a PNG. Um, and it'll go ahead and give you the most similar results. So why don't you guys spend some time playing with that? Cool. And I'll take questions. Mm -hmm. 
Whoops. Any questions? Where would you say is the most successful application of deep learning outside of images? So we've seen, you can see successful applications of deep learning outside of uh, images. Um, it's probably most mature in computer vision, but I guess uh, speech recognition is a big one. Uh, because there you also have the structure where the uh, what you're saying is related to what you were just saying previously and afterwards. Um, also, some text processing analysis tasks. So there's been some work, for instance, in word to vec uh, which takes a uh, word and turns it into a feature vector. So that's also a form of deep learning. Um, and then also there have been recurrent neural nets which uh, are fair, make fairly good language models. So it's sort of these, there are a few canonical tasks. There's a lot of research to be done still. It's a pretty new field. So, yeah. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, are your introductory slides available online somewhere? So I, I will have to ask folks at my company, um, but I would like to make them available. So if possible, I'll make them available. Yeah, any other questions? Okay, so with no other questions, uh, I did want to say that we have, this is really, we do have some other talks. We're giving some other talks. Um, so Jay, okay, hold on. Uh, Jay, who's in the audience right now, raise your hand, is giving a talk on S frames and S graphs tomorrow. Those are our scalable data structures, um, and they're really cool. And then we have a sponsor talk on Sunday by our director of product, Sean Scully. And so he'll describe a bit of what our mission is with data. So uh, thank you very much, guys. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Right. Thank you.